If you have over $200,000 sitting stagnant in your bank, retirement account, or home equity, then you're literally losing money. On this show, you learn how to get that money working for you consistently and conservatively. Learn to grow your nest egg with your host, Sean Winslow. Let's dive in. Nick, Eric, welcome to the show, guys. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to get on here. Thanks for having us on. Thanks a lot. So, Eric, and Nick, both based out of Boston, we have a little connection there, which is kind of funny. We never ran into each other. Um, Nick, I mean, Eric, as I was telling Nick earlier before you got on, I, I, was, I lived in Boston for 12 years. Um, didn't do too much investing in Boston, but was in the real estate community going to meetups and, and whatnot, RIAs and all that good stuff. But uh, if you could just both, you just tell the listeners kind of one, how you two know each other, what you do and how you got into to real estate and what you're doing in the, in the space now. Yeah. So Eric and I have known each other since we were kids, actually almost 20 years now. Um, I come from kind of construction background. My parents owned a general contracting company growing up. Um, but I never thought I'd go into that field. I don't really have, I'm not good with my hands or any of that stuff. My dad was a carpenter. My brother's a carpenter. I thought, you know, real estate's not for me. But then as I got older, I started to realize, you know, it's not all hammers and nails. There's finance involved with it. And Eric and I, uh, growing up, kind of always thought, you know, we don't want to work for someone else. We kind of want to do our own thing. And there's probably a lot of high school kids who who say, yeah, let's start a business someday. But we were stubborn about it. You know, we, we, we kept talking to each other. We went to separate colleges. And Eric actually went into finance. Um, and I got my real estate license and we, we kind of saw the financial side of real estate investing. Um, we had this plan to save up some money um, and buy a rental property together and then just kind of keep doing that um, kind of the renovate refinance route value add and, and just keep buying properties that way. So we had this goal of saving up a hundred grand, which was a pretty ambitious goal. Um, and it took us, probably three or four years um, between the two of us saving to do that. And during that time period, I had kind of, I had been working as a real estate agent and I saw another opportunity in Boston um, in the development space for condos. And so actually our first project that we ended up investing in was a a condominium development project. And that's kind of the direction we've gone in since. Um, And Eric could give his, his story, but that's kind of the general, general direction we've been going in. That's, that's awesome. Uh, that's pretty impressive raising a hunt, you know, saving a hundred grand between the two, even though it you know, took a couple of years, that's still very impressive. And um, yeah. So Eric, if you want to jump in there, go, go right ahead. Yeah. Everything Nick said, of course is, is true. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how it started. Um, the difference, uh, you know, or, or I guess, where we came back together on this project he was talking about, um, we knew, you know, we didn't want to work for someone else. We'd already decided a long time ago. And I always have a little anecdote, which we laugh about. It's like, uh, I, once I graduated college, I was working in New York city trading stocks. And like, that was, that was a great job. It was fun. It was really cool for a young kid out of college to be able to, you know, work in that environment. And I thought it was great. I was going to make a lot of money, but even the, you know, the first like minute I sat down on the first day, I said, I, I'm going to have to do this for from 65. I don't think I can sit in an office. So, you know, it was very clear that we, you know, we had to go a different direction, come back to our goal of working together. And that's kind of what we started uh, saving up and, and going that road. Um, and as Nick said, it started off the condominium project in East Boston. It was a two family. He found out that the zoning code allowed for three units there with, you know, as of right, without having to, you know, obtain any variances. Um, and that kind of kicked it all off. And we ended up selling those three units for a lot more than we had even projected. So it was a good starting uh, project for us at that point. Yeah, that whole, um, if you're going to work, why work for someone else's dream? Why not just work for your own? Like, that's kind of why I started doing what I'm doing is the same thing. Like, I have no, I love working. I have no problem working, but I want to do it for my dream. So I get some benefit out of it. My family gets benefit out of it. Right. But, but 100%. that, uh, that first deal um, was development, which is very impressive to be your first one. Did you guys solely develop that yourself? Did you have partners that had the development experience? Nick, I know you said your family's in construction. How did, how was that kind of um, established and how did that go play out? 
So we, my brother, as I said, was a carpenter, my younger brother, and he was involved with it too. And he still invests in a lot of our projects. Nowadays we hire contractors, but for the first few years, my brother actually got his general contractor's license. Um, so we self-performed and just did the work ourselves. And that first job, you know, I was over there like laying stone on the ground and, it, you know, just trying to add every cent of value, which I would, I wouldn't recommend to people, but <laughs> I also understand like your first job, you know, you, you want to really, you want to make as much profit as you can so you can keep sending that in into, you know, your next investments. So that is, uh, uh, definitely helps, but I don't think it's necessary. Um, if someone's here and then thinking, well, I, I don't have a carpenter brother or whatever. I know guys who started off with hiring contractors from day one. And I kind of wish we did that because I feel doing both. There's some guys who like to do both. They like to be the developer, which I would kind of describe as the director of the project. He gets the money together and the, all the people who are working on the job purchases the land, analyzes it. Whereas the construction where, you know, it's a little more obvious you're building the building. They're two different skill sets. So if you want to have a big team where you have people who are good at everything and they're good at both, you know, some people do that, but I recommend keeping some separation there from our own experience of doing it ourselves. And now working with GCs, I prefer the latter a lot. Um, so don't feel intimidated by having no construction background. You will have to do your homework if you're trying to get into, de into development and you don't have any construction background. You should do a little research on the major steps of building a building, um, but you don't need to be an expert in construction. You just need to hire well. Yeah. Do you have any recommendation on that hiring aspect? Because I know that's kind of where some of the bi biggest nightmares come in development is if you don't hire the right, right crew, the right guy. First thing I'd say is don't be lazy. Don't try to use Google because that was the, you know, we're, I was born in 1989, Eric born in 90. We grew up with the internet. So like we think, oh, Google it. Let's who has the most reviews. Doesn't really work that way in this industry. I think because there's just not enough reviewers on Google, you know, you'd have to have every developer go on Google and review these companies. A lot of times what you'll see on Google are, the guys who work with homeowners and they charge way more, they charge you an arm and a leg and probably there aren't, their work is good, but they're not developer contractors. So I would stay away from Google. Really what you need to use is, is word of mouth recommendations and don't be shy about asking everyone uh, tangentially related to real estate. Hey, do you have a recommendation for a GC? Do you have a rec recommendation for an electrician? talk to your mortgage broker, your realtor, other developers, just talk to everyone, ask questions and, and you'll find, you'll find good help that way. That's great. Yeah, I would say that uh, just to add to Nick's point, when we first started, that was, I don't want to say like a pain point exactly, but I'm sure a lot of people listening who are at least at the stage of getting started would think, well, I don't know anyone. How am I going to get word of mouth, you know, contractors to work for me? Um, but it, you really have to just try to buy into that. And as Nick said, anyone you come across in the industry, realtor, mortgage broker, whoever it is, talk to them. And all of a sudden you'll start to see this network just grows on its own. And, and you might not even realize it's happening until all of a sudden you realize, oh, wow, I'm, we're standing on the site of a project that the foundation's going in. And we found this thing through this guy's friend who worked for it. And then you realize, wow, this really did pay off. Uh, so I definitely don't think, you know, ah, I don't, I don't have the network. Just believe in the process that talking with everyone about it in the industry will kind of form in itself. That's great. So that general contractor, once you get that GC, do you still recommend that same approach when it comes to the, the subs or do you kind of lean on the, the GC to, to find those subs as well? Or is it kind of a, a mix of, of both? So one, one thing in general that I've, we've been kind of, we've learned this the hard way over the years is you want people to take as much work off your plate as possible. So I want the GC to be handling all that. Now yeah. you just can't do that to an irresponsible degree. You have to do, you know, basically your responsibility of having oversight over the job, make sure, you know, all the people he's working with are reputable. Um, but if you're heavily involved in the selection process, 
you're, you know, you're paying someone to do work and then you're, do, you're helping them do the work. So just, I think, try to always stick to what your strong suit is. So if your strong suit is, um, you know, contractor selection and, and working with budgets and getting it down to the, to the, you know, the lowest possible level, if that's your strong suit, then, you know, chip away at that every day. But for most people, I think who go towards development, um, they'd be better, they'd be better suited with trying to find new investors, trying to find new deals, forging new relationships. Uh, but again, this, this is just my opinion. There are guys who do both their construction and developers, but I, I have a pretty strong opinion at this point, based on my experience that let them take the work off your plate. You know, you know what you need and uh, let them do their job. Just make sure they're doing a good job. Just have good oversight. That's a great point. Time, time manages everything. Obviously time is one of our most valuable resources. Once that kind of clicked for me, that's when my business kind of took off when I was, you know, willing to give up some of that and, and put it onto others is when it really changed things around for me. So couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, well, let's talk about the, the market of Boston. As I mentioned, I lived there for 12 years, as we all know, it has one of the highest cost per square foot. I think even some parts of the city, it's might even be, it's like fluctuated between being the highest in the country. And, but it also comes with having one of the highest, you know, labor costs too, out of, out of any city. So how do you guys kind of, you know, fight those two forces and, and kind of, what would you recommend looking at when you're, when you're trying to invest in an environment like that? Well, one thing we know while the you know, labor and construction cost is high, it's pretty fixed for us in and around the city. It's, it's not really going to change much. So you, you kind of know what that variable is going in. And then it's really a matter of looking at, you know, you can do a quick back of the napkin sort of analysis where you say, okay, this is roughly how big I could build here. Uh, maybe you see some comps in the area. Maybe someone got a 10 unit building next to you and, and you're thinking, okay, well, it's a two family zone, but they're given, maybe they're granting variances. Now that sort of dynamic is, is changing in Boston right now. So you got to really do your research, see when these variances were granted. Was it five years ago or is it two months ago? Um, so if you just look at, okay, this is how much they're selling the land for. I can probably put this many units up. I know in this neighborhood of Boston, whether it's Eastie or South Boston or Dorchester, Jamaica Plain, you know what you can get per square foot on the sellout. You just, you know, you use MLS, you use CoStar, you use, um, you know, marketing, market resources that allow you to see the price per square foot. And then you just, you kind of calculate the difference. I could build it for this much, sell it for this much. How much can I pay for this thing? And if, you know, a lot of times we'll probably, 95% of the time, the prices are too high, but then you find those ones where that difference does work and that's where you can, you know, enter the deal. Right. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. I just, I don't come from a development background, so that's always intrigued me. Um, so you guys funded the, the, at least the first one, maybe a few after there with your own money. Are you still funding it with your own money? Or do you guys bring in private investors as well? So yeah, for our first few deals, it was all our own money. We actually were pretty ignorant about, you know, the, the importance of investors in real estate. Um, the past few years we've had investors involved. I believe our first investor is in 2018. Um, and we've actually really kind of greatly expanded that side of the business of getting investors involved. And that has been critical to our growth in the past few years. You know, we were going from doing a couple jobs a year, smaller jobs. Now we're doing, we have an upcoming uh, job that, you know, when it's done being built, it's going to be over $25 million worth of condos. Um, and it, and wow. I would attribute that to getting investors involved because really you can't, um, even the most successful, most, you know, wealthiest developers, most of them have investors involved in their project. It's just kind of the way it works, um, which we just didn't know going into it. But now I understand how important that is. Um, so I would say if you're if you're looking for a way to get into the real estate world, you know, if you're if you have a network of people, you're sociable and and you understand finance, raising money is a really important skill. So. Uh, if you think that that's something you could do, you'll definitely have a place in the real estate industry. 
That's a great point. It, you know, doesn't matter how, how successful or, or how wealthy you are, everyone has a bandwidth. Um, yeah. And raising, you know, one of my mentors once told me the money is in the money and it's so true. He who has the money can kind of control his own destiny. And, you know, as we know, we're, we're looking for that money. So what, how do you, how do you guys kind of approach that? Um, you know, a lot of people out in the market today say, if you have a good deal, the money will come. And, you know, I kind of go back and forth on, on agreeing with that or not. And it's like, yes and no, sure. You have a good deal, but if one, you're not, you know, putting yourself out to the market, communicating, then the money's not going to come. Um, even if it is a f- outstanding deal. So how are you guys kind of putting your, the winter spring name out in the market and, and attracting those investors? We've done a lot of marketing, um, especially the last year. We've really boosted our social media presence. Um, we brought on now a couple of years ago, a good friend of ours, Kyle, for a long time. He, we've known him um, and he's acting, you know, as sort of our head of acquisitions and investor relations. So he's talking with owners to maybe get off market deals. Um, and then we can get them under contract. They have a contingency to go through zoning. So that's kind of step one of the outreach and branding and marketing, but it's specific to investors. Um, we're doing, as I said, a lot of marketing, we're putting out a lot of materials, we're putting out a lot of content, just giving a lot of stuff away for free. Um, eBooks, um, you know, we have a very nice website now. Um, and so Kyle will, will talk to a lot of these people kind of show our brand off. We send out presentations to people who are interested who've already, you know, said they're interested in maybe seeing, uh, you know, potential deals and, and future opportunities with us. So when we have one, we talk with them, we, uh, we show them, look, this is kind of what we've done so far. So we're at the stage now where we've had a lot of individual investors through our network. Um, but we've, we're also kind of at this in, in inflection point where we're dealing even with capital markets brokers who are introducing us to equity groups for larger check sizes. Um, and that's kind of a transition we've been going through the last six months or so. Uh, especially for this larger deal we, Nick mentioned a few minutes ago, it'll be a $25 million development. Um, that's something where you, you might need to take an LP equity from a group, uh, from, you know, a private equity group uh, who invests specific in, um, you know, real estate condo development is a bit more of a niche thing, sort of. So the, a lot of times you'll see they prefer multifamily rentals. Um, so we kind of have, uh, you know, headway into this space that we can talk with them and say, okay, we're experts at this. These are our numbers. This is how it looks. Um, and they'll present you offers. This is what we could, uh, you know, this is the type of capital we could provide you. This is the type of return we'd want. And we try to come to an agreement based on what we offered and what they want um, and just kind of work them into the capital stack. Um, so it's just started off directly to people who are interested based on very organic marketing. Um, now we have the capital market brokers that were working with a lot of them who have connections to many groups, even all over the world. We have investors interested from, you know, the UK, um, other parts of Europe. That's awesome. Yeah. Hot market like Boston, it's, it's going to attract it kind of does it the marketing itself. You know, once you get your name out there, it's going to attract the money from all over. <clears throat> we'll have to talk offline about private equity. Cause I've, I've explored that as well we could have a whole episode on that. So I won't, I won't dive too deep into that. Great. Um, but, uh, you mentioned multifamily, so you primarily, um, develop condos. Would you develop multifamily or even acquire st- stabilized, uh, multifamily, or is it primarily just right now folks on development of, of condos? Yeah. So right now we're, we've got a couple different, um, things we're doing simultaneously. So we're, we're sticking with our, our condominium development strategy. Um, we have an affordable housing job, which we could talk about a little bit, I'm sure. And then we're also looking for value add. Um, we're trying to kind of marry our skills as a developer so we could create, you know, deals where other people can see them. So a lot of, one of the things we're focusing on right now is, trying to convert old office buildings into apartments. There's a lot of cities that have outdated zoning codes and you'll see kind of a main corridor transit oriented area with all these, you know, office vacancies. And we know how to get projects entitled. So we could go in there and get a variance, you know, it might be zoned for office, but that was 
a mistake basically by city planners decades ago and they just don't have the political wherewithal to change it because it's very difficult to change zoning code so you go in there you get a variance which is seems difficult but if you have experience with it you know that's what one of the things you should look for um as advice to people who are new how can you add value where other people couldn't so that's kind of our strategy right now um, we have a deal that we might be close to to getting a, an accepted offer for that so that's kind of what we're looking at for the um acquiring existing assets um we want to we want to make a greater return so the office conversion strategy is one way we could do that um but also in terms of acquiring you know existing rentals we we had a pretty big we cast a wide net we were looking in the southeast for almost a year um the past year because we wanted to acquire kind of a larger property down there but we've put a pause on that for now um because we're just kind of a little bit worried about the cap rate compression that's going on down there um i saw a chart the other day that in the in the span of the past year the southeast cap rates have dropped below the northeast cap rates whereas you know they've dropped significantly below um and last year they were significantly above. So that kind of raises some red flags to me because I don't think the Southeast has suddenly, you know, become that much more robust economically in the span of a year. I think there's some speculation going on there. So we're open to that. We, we like those markets, but it's a little, we're a little bit worried. There's still deals to be had, obviously. Um, but it's, it seems like it's kind of a, a time sink, whereas we could, buy buildings up here and add value with the skills we already have down there seems a little bit risky to us right now. Yeah. I know we, we kind of talked about the, this before we hit record and yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. It, it's where I focus, but when you see, you know, cap rates between like a class and like B and C where it's, it's only a spread of like 20 to 50 basis points, that's kind of scary. Yep. Uh, you know, cause yeah, the, the argument is when you buy those like B and C class, you kind of get the trickle down effect when the when the economy happens, people move down. But also, you're you're dealing with a property that's got going to have way more maintenance issues than like an A class. So the the question is now, why don't you are do you just shift to that higher higher class? Your investors will get a little less return, but it kind of makes sense when when caps are so compressed. I know. Eric, you might want to jump on this because you got the finance background, but yeah, it, it's kind of perplexing um, to see that, especially I didn't think I'd see Southeast cap rates below Northeast. That's kind of why I got out of the Northeast. And now it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, circling around, hitting me in the face. Yeah. I think uh, you hit it, the nail on the head. I mean, that discrepancy between class A and, you know, the, the class class C even property in some cases yeah. is that Delta is not big enough to really dive into some of those lower end ones. And, and it, as you said, yeah, okay. There's sort of the trickle down effect. There's that argument to be made that if the economy goes south a bit, people might start moving into those and, and you kind of reclaim some of that. But even if you're looking at, I think we talked about this earlier. Um, a lot of these guys going into these deals now, they have to get a bridge loan. They have to, they, they can't get traditional agency financing because they have to come up to their pro forma numbers before the deal even makes sense for your average lender. Um, and they might be talking two, three years out after they've implemented a huge value add strategy that takes a lot of time and effort. And there's a lot of nuance to it and things might not go exactly as, you know, your spreadsheet entails and they never do. Um, so you, you can make yeah. a spreadsheet, say whatever you want. Uh, what's all right, great. We're going to increase rents annually by 15% because maybe this one specific market of Florida over the last two years has averaged that. But I mean, you know, that, that can't obviously continue forever. Um, so our thought was, as you just said, all right, over this last year, as we were looking, we kind of shifted and said, all right, let's start looking at some class A properties. Cause really what's the difference. It'll be much easier to handle. You'll probably have more interest at first. Um, yeah, your, your, your rent or pool might be smaller because they need a bit higher income to rent these units, but the, there's a lot more, I guess, flashiness to it and nicer looking um, properties. There's more amenities. So why not? We'll, we'll take a slight hit, but we'll own this thing early on and it's in its life cycle. Um, 
because you you compare it and yeah, your best case on some of these class C deals, you, you go into like a four cap now or something. And what can you, you can bring it up after several years of hard work and effort to maybe like a six, which, oh, you've increased the cap rate by 50%. That sounds great. You're still in a six cap after all this. Whereas up here, we could enter around there with this strategy that Nick was just going over. Um, and maybe we get it even higher than that from our, from our basis point. And uh, it just, it began to be, it sound too unattractive to us to enter these properties built in 1981 at a, you know, four, 4.25 cap rate yeah. when you're speculating on, on the growth. Yeah. I think you, I think you hit the nail on the head with the bridge debt. Like it's a great tool. I've used it. Um, we'll use it in the future, but in a market right now where we don't really know where rates are going, I, I don't think they'll, they'll, they'll go up in the, in the near term. But if you're buying, you know, bridge in your, in your business plan, it's going to take at least three years to do that whole value add, that whole CapEx business plan. We don't know where rates are going to be in three years. So you could you be re know. refinancing into long-term debt when now the rates are, you know, above four, hopefully not above five, but above 4%, but you just never know. It could be. So that, that's the, like you said, that's the risk you're taking. So yeah, you want to take a, that risk on a C class, you want to take that risk on an A class, which then you're probably gonna be able to get long-term debt on. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's one of those conversations I have inside my head all the time. So, <laughs> um, no, but, uh, tell me about winter spring. I love the name. Any, any meaning for you guys? Yeah. So it's funny, Eric and I, we've been friends actually, as I said, since we were kids and, um, when we were in high school, we, uh, we were good students. I should preface this by saying, but we were also <laughs> very big, uh, video gamers and we loved this, uh, game. Probably most people have heard of it. World of Warcraft. Yep. And, um, winter spring is actually a part of the game where you reach the maximum level. Like you become as strong as your character could be. So it just kind of had some like, uh, I don't know, like inside joke sort of sentimental value to us, but it also sounds, it sounds pleasant and it doesn't sound like, you know, it doesn't sound like a dungeon of, of, of a fantasy world or whatever. It, it sounds like it could be a normal company. So we thought, why don't we name the company after this? Um, and just kind of our, I'd say our company culture, we like to have, um, you know, Eric said, we have our other friend, Kyle working with us. We have a, a team of seven people at this point. We like to keep it light because real estate is very stressful at times, especially development. Um, and uh, we, we just try to keep, you know, the whole atmosphere of like, all right, we're having fun. You know, it's like we, we used to be people who played video games together. We want to keep that energy going into this uh, sometimes very perilous and stressful <laughs> <laughs> path we've chosen for ourselves. No, I love that. Hey, culture is everything. And if, you, if you're not having fun, why? why do it? Especially with the, like you said, the stress of development. So exactly. yeah, I love that. Um, so we're just talking about debt, about multifamily. I'm in, in or a stabilized multifamily and where cap rates are. Well, I'm curious to know, like what, where's debt for construction, especially in, I'm sure there's an appetite in Boston, obviously, but what's, what's debt look like right now? It really depends on what you're looking for. I mean, if you go with a conventional lender for say a construction loan, um, you're, you're not going to be too far above what you're seeing, um, for, for existing rental properties. Um, maybe, maybe closer to say like 5%. It's typically where we'll see a construction loan based on our financial wherewithal and background and the relationships we have with lenders. Um, there's another route though, that you can go depending on the project size is, is private debt in those mm -hmm. rates, you know, to people will hear hard money, that type of thing. Um, there are, you know, larger institutions who focus just on large construction projects and, and their private debt, private lenders, private debt fund. Um, there's different types and their rates will be higher, say, you know, six and a half, seven and a half, even upwards of 10%, depending on what you're trying to do and how much leverage they're willing to give you and how much you know, um, of a net worth uh, covenant, you can meet those factors all play a role. So some of our projects, it's made more sense for us to go the private route, just because the ease of, of getting the loan, just getting started, getting the, you know, pulling in the requisition draws as we move along with construction. Um, they can be a bit more nimble than a conventional lender. 
they can close a lot faster. They may have less requirements um, of you as the borrower. Um, so even though the rate's a lot higher, um, that can make sense too. So those are kind of the two forces we'll, you know, I don't want to say struggle with, but, you know, decide between as we're working on a project, the smaller one will we'll typically just go conventional, um, larger one. Um, we've had to go private. Um, and that's, again, just a, a consequence of a lot of the requirements. You're building a $25, $25 million project and your loan is, you know, 15 to 20 million. Um, not everyone has the net worth to meet that requirement that a conventional lender would put on. So that's where right. maybe a private lender would come into play. So we're seeing a lot of debt options, and but there's, there's certainly no shortage of debt available uh, for projects. It's just about what fits for your specific project in your you know financial picture as the sponsors. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. And I know for usually a conventional construction loan, there's usually like a draw and for the listeners that don't really know what that is, it's, it's kind of where you have to show invoices to get them the money from the lender. Um, usually they'll give you, you know, partial upfront. And then, you know, when the jobs competed, there's usually some threshold or time frame you have to meet. Um, and we do that in uh, when we bridge debt, when we get it financed by the bank, they do that too. So we'll actually raise extra money on the raise just to have it in the bank from, you know, from day one go time. So we, so we can get stuff moving. Does in the private lending world on that, is that a same, that the same thing or you just get the money up front? Yeah, it'll always be based on uh, draws or uh, you could also call them requisitions. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, the system you described is how it will be pretty much with everyone. Okay. And um, what, when you're new, if you have no background, if you're trying to get into development, private lending is a great option. Um, it's going to be hard to get conventional lenders to lend on your first project. But if your credit isn't in a complete mess, um, you can usually get private lenders. You'll just have to pay you know, a couple more points. And then as Eric said, we're at a point where we have a pretty good track record um, and we've been building for years, but then you run into, you want to scale up and do much larger projects well, they, then you have net worth covenants and you have to, your net worth has to be equal to these massive loans, which, you know, maybe some people have been doing this for 30 years. They've, they've built up their net worth enough to do that. But if you're young and you're, you're trying to scale your company, again, private lending is a great option. And what we've found is we've uh, been shopping around this project um, to different lenders. There's so many different options available out there. There's, you know, there's, there's equity groups, there's capital markets brokers who will get you a low LTC debt option, and then they'll fill in the rest with a big check from an equity group. Or there could be private lenders who fund a really large amount of the LTC up to 90%, even on a big job like this. So don't assume that, you know, you've talked to a couple of groups, you know, all the options, you actually have to, you have to talk to a lot of people to really figure out what all your options are. And, and we did that on this project. I'm very grateful we did. We contacted probably 60 different, what is it, Eric? You have a, Eric has a list. It's over 60 different groups, capital markets, brokers, um, equity groups, debt groups to really understand, okay, how can we assemble this capital stack in a way that's the best for us? And you'll see that some of them will say, Hey, look, you, we have to work. You have to work exclusively with us. And that just wasn't going to work for us. And this, we had to have a lot of, you know, feelers out there. We had to put as many eggs as we could in this basket. We, we couldn't just stick with one. And some of them, as Nick said, do both debt and equity. They'll help you find both. They try to marry the two. A lot of times the equity group will want specific debt. They'll say this private debt's too expensive. You guys got to go with my guy. Um, and that's another way sort of these relationships come into play. Um, Another thing, Nick mentioned LTC for any of the listeners, it's loan to cost. So our cost would be, say, for this project, about 20 million um, in terms of all, you know, purchasing the land, construction, soft costs, which include, you know, legal permits, architectural plans. So about 20 million total. So when he says 75 LTC, they're willing to lend you 15 million. Mm -hmm. LTV would be on the actual value of the whole building at the end. Well, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Sometimes when I, I get into this, I, you know, it's terms we know and we're just like, yeah, right. Yep, yep. right. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, yeah, we gotta we gotta look out for the people who are trying to learn. That's why they're listening right. to the podcast in right. the first place. Exactly. But um, Nick, that was a Nick and Eric, that was a great point. Like always, always shop it around. Um, I learned this early on too. I like, don't just go to the first guy or gal and be like, oh, this they must have shopped around for me, and this must be the the best rate or offer or terms. No, that's not the case. Go to there's certain people that have different appetites for certain things that are different than others, and they have different products and investors they can pull in. So yeah, I, I learned that early on that just always shop it around. And and like what Eric said, it's it's all a relationship game too. So even even when you build that relationship over time, these guys are gonna and cows are gonna be able to go to bat for you a little bit more too. So that's right. Um, and then Absolutely. when it comes when it comes to that that net worth part, that's it, that's a huge component because um they want to have you to have a net worth of the loan and then a liquid. I'm not sure what it is con, for the development construction side, but like usually at least 10% a liquid net worth of that loan. So not everyone's going to, not everyone has that, especially earlier on in your career. So it, it's, you know, it's important to have those avenues where you can go, whether it be private lender or bring a partner on that, you know, give them a cut of the deal to, to just put up his balance, his or her balance sheet. So. Yeah, that's thanks for bringing that up. That's a great point. Um, yeah, absolutely. You, Thank you. Would you guys be willing to jump into a deal? Um, just kind of, you know, walk us through from start to finish. Doesn't have to be in too much detail, but I'm I'm just kind of intrigued on on the development side. Yeah. So, like one of the deals we've done. Yeah. Yeah. So we bought. I could go. This is this deal is like really um, start to finish. Um, so. We bought this building, and this is a, this is a smaller deal too. So this would be good for um, people who are starting out. So we bought this building. It was a two-family in a three-family zone, and um, we bought it for six hundred thousand. And we we had done kind of scouted the neighborhood, and we saw that across the street there was an eight-unit new construction, and down the street there was another you know six-unit or so. So it's in a three family zone, which means by the letter of the law, you can only build three units there. But in a lot of a lot of towns and cities, municipalities, um, you can get what's called a variance or a special permit. You know, they use different terminology, but basically what it means is you're getting special permission beyond what's written in the zoning code. So what we did is in Boston, that's a highly political process. Um, which makes it very hard to do, very stressful, um, can be miserable, honestly, at points, really, when neighbors are screaming at you during community meetings. But it also, it's a barrier to entry that allows you to add a lot of value if you can scale those barriers. So we bought that building, and then we had maybe a, about a six to eight month entitlement process where we were getting that special permission. And we went in, in the first meeting, we tried to do nine units. And if we had gotten nine units, that would have been a crazy good project. Um, you know, we would have made a lot of money from just a single project. But like what usually happens, we went to the community meeting and they said nine units too much. So we negotiated down. We changed the design a couple times. Um, we met with a local politician and his family actually lived on the street behind us. So we met with them a couple times and he he's very in touch with the neighborhood. So he kind of knew you know, the neighborhood's not going to like that. They're going to like this. So we met with them and we just kept revising and changing our design. Now, if you're in a place with very lax zoning, you won't have to do all this. But if you're in a place like Boston or just, you know, more blue, more um, red tape sort of areas with, with a lot of politics involved, um, this is kind of how it's going to be for you too. Boston's one of the strictest, but Anyways, we had to go through that whole process. We ended up getting approved for seven units. Um, then we have to get our building permit. So entitlement just is basically them giving you this permission saying you're allowed to build this building. Then the building permit is the actual permit that says you can do construction. They're two separate things. Once you get your entitlement, you need a whole more robust set of architectural plans. You get your engineers involved. You get the full construction package. Um, at this point, we we had we purchased the land with a, a normal loan, and then once you're ready for construction, you refinance into a loan with a, a construction loan as well as you know carrying the building. 
So we, we had a construction loan for this project for 2.4 million. So we bought it for 600,000 construction loan for 2.4 million, seven condos, I believe our gross sales. Do you remember the gross sales on this one, Eric? Yeah, they were about, about 4 million. So a little over. So, uh, you know, we sold each condo individually. I believe three of the units were to investors and the, the rest were to homeowners. Um, and a lot of those condos, we started our marketing during construction. So we try to get pre-sales. So as soon as we finish, we can close on those units, significantly reduce our debt and our carrying costs. So we had most of the units in that building pre-sold. I believe we had one left. Um, at the end. And it took us like a month to sell that one. Um, and we ended up making, you know, all things considered around a million on the project. Solid. That's a solid deal. Yeah. But it's, it's not for the faint of heart though, especially that uh, permitting and zoning process. <laughs> no, it's uh, it will, you'll have some sleepless nights with that stuff. We, we have. Yeah. I've been to a, I've been to a, some neighborhood meetings before they can, they can get a little hostile if they, if they don't, if they don't like your project. They'll they, call you stupid, arrogant, greedy. Animals. Um, greedy. Yeah, they, they, everyone, what I always say is everyone's watched like a TV show or a cartoon with like a, an evil developer like cun down a tree and people are just like zo- like zombies. They just think that you're some evil person. Meanwhile, you're, you're building this like small little building that fits right in with the neighborhood. I mean, you go to our website, you see our buildings, they, they fit right in. They're nice. They're, we've done like historical restorations where we were like very respectful and like kept old fireplaces and, yep. but they don't care. They, they're, they're out there for blood. The people who go to these meetings. Oh, they are. You, you can't even tell that some of these, the one Nick's talking about in a, in a later meeting in the same part of Boston, someone said, well, why'd you only do two units over there then your last project? And we said, that's seven units, but that's the point. You can't even tell from the street. It's worked in very well. And she, you know, that this person sort of, I don't want to say was tricked, but they're saying, why can't you do, we're trying to do six near them. And they said, well, why can't you just do like the two unit you did? We said, well, you'll see, it will look like two units, just like that one did. And we even had a parking garage under that one for five parking spaces. Oh, wow. Because so these urban infill projects, like when you're building in between already developed areas, if you have to go through a neighborhood process like this, really important to make it blend in and our architect is really good at that where it it, like eric saying this neighbor on a new project we're getting entitled we had told her past projects we did she drove by that that past project i just described to you and she thought it's only two units that's intentional because our architect designs it that it you look at it from the street you can't tell how many units there are then we go to you know this new neighbor's neighborhood and we're doing the same thing. We're presenting a building that if you looked at it once it's done, you won't be able to tell it, it's more than two units, but they, they don't believe you because <laughs> right. it hasn't been built yet. Because <laughs> well, so. well, then they can't fight on you anymore. So yeah, they right. don't want to fight. People who go are fighters. They're, like, oh, you yeah. always say this, Nick, it's true. If you get a notice in the mail, hey, come, there's a development going up in your neighborhood. If you don't care, you're not going to go. You're never going to go and be like, oh, I support this. This is great. You're just throwing the trash. <laughs> it's yep. it's the only people who show up are adamantly against it usually. Oh, 100%. I went to one in um, the north end for a condo development, yeah, and they were they were not happy. You know, A lot of you know, <laughs> no, people that have lived there for a long time. Yeah, uh, the north so. end especially. Very yeah. tight. Even oh, yeah. Tighter, you know. And then I, seat, I went, I don't even know how you fit construction trucks down some of those streets. Oh, it was, yeah, it's crazy. And then I went to one in the uh, downtown crossing area. Um, and all the people from the, oh, was it the Ritz that has oh, the, no. uh, the condos? <laughs> yeah. They all showed up because the proposed was like 30 stories. So they were no. not happy about that. It was going to take away their, <laughs> their, their view, you know, <laughs> of the other building next to them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Typical. So yeah, not for the faint of heart. Well, uh, I don't want to wrap up. I don't want to take up too much of your time here, gentlemen, but the show, you know, it's obviously it's called multifamily money. So it's about, you know, investing in multifamily real estate. Cause as I believe, and I'm sure you do too, real estate is one of the best ways to build wealth, but it's, it's not necessarily what you make, but what you keep. So another segment of our, our show is about finance. Cause I come from that background as well. 
so it, I just want to ask both of you one, why do you like real estate? How can it help you, you know, achieve your dreams and your goals? And then two, any advice from a finance standpoint on, you know, how to build that wealth and how to keep that wealth. I know Nick, you alluded to it with, you know, it can really help getting your, your credit in check, even when it comes to, you know, simply looking for, for private money and, and for traditional money too. Yeah, I would say, um, one reason, um, and not to speak for Nick, but I know he shares this similar to me is, um, real estate, as you said, is a great way to build wealth. Um, we think it's the best way to do it. You look at, you know, the richest people in the world. I mean, they, the majority of these people built their wealth in some capacity through real estate, or they own a lot of real estate. So you all, you know, historically it's an appreciating asset class, no matter what you're seeing over time, real estate price continue to go up. It's a good hedge against inflation. Uh, you have a physical asset. I mean, those are all kind of the, the, the obvious sort of things to us. I mean, a very basic way to look at it, but you invest in a stock and the company goes bankrupt. I mean, your stock's worth zero. If you if you buy a building and you don't have insurance on it, even which you wouldn't be allowed to really do if you're mortgaging it, but just say the worst case scenario you could imagine, it burns down, all you have is a piece of land. You still have the piece of land. There's still value to that. So it's like the worst case scenario, you're never going to be at zero. And most likely it's going to continue to climb. Um, and what, what was the other part of your question? I'm sorry. The finance. No, you're good. No, yeah. Just personal finance, you know, cause it's not necessarily what you make, but what you keep any advice, you know, on that. Sure. End yeah. of things. And, and Nick, you can chime in with your sort of version of this, but if you're getting into it and, and really want a good way to start, uh, what I did is, um, I have a two family, my wife and I bought, um, and we rent out one of the other units, uh, and we lived in the first floor unit, um, and, you know, it's your house, so you can make the rules however you want. Like, there's a big yard that's just ours. So it feels like we're in a normal single family house, but it's kind of called house hacking. I think the term yep. a lot of people use. Um, so that really gets you set on a good financial path in terms of entering real estate. It might allow you to even get a loan a bit easier because you automatically have this income coming in from the property that the bank sees. Um, and if you pick the right tenant, I mean, it can be a very peaceful living scenario where you own a property, it's appreciating, you're generating income from it. Maybe it covers the majority or most of your mortgage. Um, and when you're ready to move out, you could sell an asset that's likely appreciated and you know put a down payment on a bigger house that you want or another investment property even, or you can hold on to it. And now you have a small, um, in my case, you know, two family, you can rent out while you live somewhere else. And Nick, you kind of have your own version too. Yeah, very similar story. I guess I'll answer why I like real estate first. I I think it's when you look at, you know, the Federal Reserve sets a, a target of 2% inflation per year. Your money's being inflated away. You have to invest it in something to protect it, let, let alone not even just talking about growing it, just protect the money you already have. If I'm forced to do that, I'm definitely thinking real estate because, you know, I have, we have money in stocks, you know, Eric and I both have 401k through the company. Um, but by and large, like the stock market, I think is just kind of, there's too many variables, you know, it's, it's all interconnected. Um, something could happen in Europe that suddenly, you know, brings the whole stock market down, you know, something could happen in China. We saw that, um, Evergrande or the developer there yeah. that's going potentially going under all these variables could could affect you and they seem like not even related to the investment you're making which to me feels like a lack of control and i'm not saying i want to con have control over every like intricate piece of my investments quite the opposite i want it to be as hands off as possible but i don't like this feeling of like something can creep up on you from some completely unexpected angle and wipe out you know, all this value you've built up in your investments, whereas real estate, especially with development, you know, we find the land, we have the vision of the building we're going to put there, or, or we find an office building, we say, hey, this would be a great place for apartments. Um, we control it, we control the business plan. Um, we want it to be hands off, as I said, but I think it's just something you can wrap your head around a lot more. And to, to what Eric said about house hacking, I think house hacking is a really great place to start. 
Um, and I think just in general for personal finance, just always try to find ways that your skills, step one is build up some skills. And then once you have them, find ways that your skills can reduce, you know, your, your burden. Um, like what I did was, um, I actually, for the house I live in, I built two condos. Um, it was, a it's in a, in a suburbs. I wanted to move into a really nice town, um, to raise my kids, really good school system, very expensive town. And I, you know, I'm not a fan of having, you know, huge as someone in real estate, I don't like the idea of paying monthly mortgage and I'm not getting like income to offset it or something like that. So what I did was I, uh, I built two condos and I sold the other one. So basically I'm, I'm living in my condo, you know, as if I had, I had bought a house out on the stick somewhere where it's very cheap. Um, I, it's not complete. I didn't completely wipe out my debt, but I'm living in a really nice town for I'm paying less than I was in rent in a, you know, a 700 square foot apartment. So that's awesome. Those sort yeah. of tricks and, and ways you can add value to your own life and your own finances. Always be looking for them. Very important. No, that's great. And I think you both made some great points, like the whole stock market thing. It's, it's the fact that like a tweet or some breaking news can, like you said, can affect that stock, even if it's not even the same industry or same, you know, sphere, it's, it still can affect it. Whereas like if, if, if something happens in China, it's not going to affect my rental income and my property here in the United States. And exactly. there's just so much risk and so many un, unknowns at, at play that it, it to, it's funny when people say to me, when I, when I first tell them what I do, that they view it as risky. And I'm like, well, where, like, where's your money? Oh, it's, you know, mutual funds, ETF stock market. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. How's, how's that? Roller, <laughs> how's that roller coaster? Yeah. Um, and then too, you mentioned the inflation too. I've been beating the drum on this and I'm sure my listeners can attest to this. So you've heard it from someone else. It's not just me. It's a, it's a great way to uh, hedge against inflation and it's here. I don't know why there's some conversation about transitory because I don't <laughs> see that at all, but um, yeah, it's a great way to hedge against inflation. So I, I thank you both for your time. Um, where can uh, the listeners find you? Yeah, we're on uh, Instagram, Instagram slash win winter spring capital. Um, I wrote a book that goes over the whole system of our development. You can get, get that at winterspringcapital.com slash development dash book. Uh, Eric and I are also on LinkedIn. Just look up our names, Nicholas Earls and Eric DiNicola, and just check out our website, winterspringcapital.com. Got a ton of articles about pretty much everything we've learned uh, since starting the, the business. That's great. It's all, it's all about giving value, like the whole givers, giver's gain approach. You know, it, it's just, it's one, it's a great thing to do. And then two, it, it just helps everyone, including yourself. So I recommend that to everyone listening go check out their stuff. I've already downloaded it, some of it and it's great. So I, re I re recommend doing that Thank as well. You. Yeah, of course. Um, well, hey guys, Nick, Eric, I really appreciate your time. I know you guys are busy. Um, next time I'm down in Boston, we should, uh, I want to check out one of your properties. We should, we should link up. Let's do it. Absolutely. All right. Thanks guys. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Sean. Hey, this is Sean Winslow. After being in the financial service industry for years and having candid conversations with good people just like you, I realized that so many of us are wanting an investment strategy that provides solid returns and consistent income without the bumps in the road. There's little known secret that your financial advisor doesn't want you to know. There is investment out there that is less volatile and the returns are stronger. Get more details by going to greenbriarcg.com and clicking on the free e-report. And by the way, if this show has provided you any value, then feel free to leave an honest written review and of course, share it with a friend who needs it. See you next week for another great show.